So thank you for having us. Uh, let me, there we go. So this, this will be our last um, monthly shaken session uh, and kind of following the same patterns that we always do, we're going to start with some uh, recent regulatory and industry news and then we're going to do a, a technical deep dive into uh, this month will be call analytics and how that relates to Sir Shaken. And finally, we'll leave some time at the end for questions um, and, and just general discussion. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Transnexus was founded in 1997. We're a software company. We, we write software for telephone service providers to manage their, their networks. Uh, and that software includes, of course, Sir Shaken robocall prevention features, the, the highlights of this uh, this session and this whole actually series of sessions, uh, as well as TDOS prevention, telecom fraud prevention, least cost routing, reporting and analytics, as, as well as a number of other um, kind of management related functions. Uh, myself, uh, right here, uh, I'll, I'll be going over the, the technical deep dive. And uh, but first, I'm going to hand it over to Donald to do our kind of recent regulatory news and uh, go through that. I think there's a lot that, that's happened in the past month, and uh, it's uh, Sir Shakin's really. Oh, well, a lot's been happening. So I'll, I'll, with that, I'll hand it over to Donald to go into the weeds of it. Okay, thank you, Alec, and welcome everybody to today's session. We're looking forward to sharing some information about what's been happening. I have three highlights, but there's there's a lot in it. Uh, the first one is comments were filed on robocall blocking rules. And the next one, the big one, just happened last week, the FCC published their second round of stir shaken deployment rules. And there's there's a bunch of that, but we'll give you the highlights and point where you can find more detailed information. And then they, uh, just yesterday, uh, the robocall blocking safe harbor rules were read into the federal register. So that sets the uh, effective date next month. So the first item on our list is uh, robocall blocking comments that were uh, published, that were sent in by last uh, August 30th. It was interesting, there were I think 32 different entities uh, provided comments and, and one of those was a group of 10, so there were over 40 organizations felt um, motivated to give their two cents on what they think about these rules. And I'll just give you some highlights here. Uh, there was no support about over 40 for um, call blocking just on the basis of stir shaken. So I see a stir shaken and based upon my uh, verification results, I'm gonna block that call. Nobody thought that was a good idea. Um, also, if a call wasn't signed, so I get a call, terminating provider gets a call and it's not signed by stir shaken, should I block it? Nobody thought that was a good idea. Uh, the, the consensus across the board was that uh, call authentication, that is stir shaken, should be used in conjunction with call analytics. So that's a perfect setup <laughs> for today's session where uh, Alec is going to take a deeper dive into call analytics and give you some ideas on how those two go together and complement each other and, and what is made much more effective and stronger by the other. When you put them together, you really got something. There was also a lot of conversation the FCC asked, what do you think about uh, providing safe harbor for network blocking or what uh, AT&T calls provider initiated blocking. Well, don't, don't we already have that? N not exactly. What we have now is um, blocking, uh, opt-in blocking for the subscriber level, but this uh, network blocking is where the provider would look at call traffic and just block it before it ever came anywhere near. Uh, looking at, at the, um, what the subscriber is opted in or opted out of. And uh, there was a sharp divide. Voice service providers were in favor of this and uh, high volume enterprise callers were opposed. And um, the voice service providers liked it because they said, you know, we've got to get these bad calls out of our network. We're using a lot of bandwidth on these. And uh, we could tell with a pretty high level of reliability where the bad call traffic is. So why don't we just um, let us block it and give us safe harbor for doing that in case we make a mistake, we won't get sued. High volume callers said um, no, because the subscriber cannot opt out of that like they can now. So they were opposed to that. Um, 
And the third one that was received a lot of discussion is this, the FCC asked, should there be call blocking notification? So right now a high volume caller places their calls to their, um, to their uh, called party and the call gets blocked, but they really can't tell what happened. They're like, well, they didn't answer. <laughs> it didn't go to voicemail. What happened? Did I get blocked? They have to do a lot of running around to figure out why they're not getting through. They're asking for a notification that could be a audio message that says your call has been blocked. Please contact such and such contact if you think this was an error. Or uh, the other uh, proposed technology is to do a return a SIP code, a particular SIP code for uh, your call has been refused by the called party. And you could use that and say, oh, well, at least I know now I'm getting blocked. So let me go see if I can get that fixed. Uh, some voice service providers, although not all, but some are opposed to that. Um, some others are okay with it. Um, and one of the interesting objections has been the notion that if you have a bad actor, just if you turn it on their fire hose and robo calls, if you send them a block message, they'll go, oh, well, I'm being blocked. They'll immediately change tactics and do something else to get around the block. So the block won't be very effective for very long. And an interesting comment the first time I've noticed it was one of the commenters uh, from the high volume enterprise caller industry said, well, you know what? Those bad actors, robocallers, they, are, they already know very quickly if their calls are getting blocked and they, and they pivot anyway. So if we send them a notification they're they're going to figure that out pretty quick anyway because they're pretty good at that. You know who's not good at that are are the high volume callers. We can't tell what's going on, and we're trying to get through it, and we can't tell that we're being blocked. So that would be a a help to us. It wouldn't be that much make that much difference for the bad actors. So that's why we think you should uh, do call blocking notification. So stay tuned to see what comes of that. Um, it's hard to tell which way that's going to go, but there is an interesting variety of opinions. If you want some more, we've got um, summaries of all of these comment replies on our website and a blog post on that. So now we'll turn to the next item that we were going to cover. And that's this, the big one that came last week. This is in a 93 page document just loaded full of new rules on stir shaken. And it's a big deal. I'm just going to do a few highlights here real quickly so we could get on to call authentication. But I think the big one is that the shaken mandate was extended two years for small providers. And a small provider is a provider that has 100,000 or fewer subscriber lines. So they get an extra two years before they have to mandate. There's three other categories of extensions. Um, one of them that's very interesting is providers that can't get a certificate. Right now under the governance authority rules, a provider has to um, meet three requirements uh, in order to get a certificate. One of them is that they have to have access to numbering resources. And the extension for this one is um, providers that can't get a certificate are given an extension until they can get a certificate. And that's interesting, especially at another place to this set of rules they included now over the top providers for the first time have been included in the list of voice service providers that are subject to the mandate. So it seems like the FCC is sort of giving a little bit of general gentle pressure by the governance authority to include well, now they've officially included over the top providers in the list of people who are subject to this mandate, but they've given them an extension until they can get certificates, which now they can't get them unless they have access to numbering resources. So it seems like they're urging the governance authority to expand eligibility to participate in shake and sign calls. So stay tuned, that'll be real interesting to follow. And then um, the other two are, uh, services that are scheduled be to be discontinued. You don't have to, uh, you get an extension. That way you don't have to implement it for a few months if you're already planning to discontinue that service. And then this other one was, I think, very interesting. We talked about out of band shake a, a few months ago. And that's a way for 
to do store shaking uh, across networks that aren't all SIP because you send the token directly from the originating provider to the terminating provider over the internet. And um, <laughs> they made an interesting uh, extension of the mandate that said, you're not, and this is different than the way they worded it before. Before they just said, if it's not SIP, you're not subject to the mandate. But now they said parts of the network that aren't SIP are not subject to the mandate until there's a solution for that. And that relates to out of band shaking. So if out of band shaking becomes a a solution for that, then um, providers who have non IP networks would all of a sudden become subject to the mandate. So that's very interesting. And stay tuned on that one. We have a few more in the next slide on that. Now, uh, even if for providers that receive this extension, they're still required to deploy robocall mitigation next June 30th, June 30th, 2021. And all providers will have to file to certify their compliance. They have to say either they're doing stir shake it or they're doing robocall mitigation. Everybody has to be in and in in explain what they're doing. Okay, and then on the next slide, there's a few more items in this set of orders. This one is, is odd or unexpected, I guess, intermediate providers, are they gonna be uh, mandated to assign calls or not? Well, first of all, of course, everybody was in agreement with this in the comments is that they should, they must pass the shaken headers through their network unaltered. So they can't block them, they can't drop them. Everybody expected that. The surprise is that they will be required to authenticate unauthenticated calls, but, <laughs> this requirement is waived if they register and cooperate with traceback. So if you're an intermediate provider, you have to sign calls, but if you register with the traceback consortium, you don't. Consortium, you don't. And then the final one I want to mention is that out-of-band shaking um, will be mandated if it can meet two requirements. One is fully developed and finalized standards, which as we mentioned on our topic about that a few months ago, that's well on its way. And the other one is that the, the stuff you need for it, equipment, if any, and software have to be available on the commercial market, and that's well on its way too. So if, if that happens and it becomes mandated as a way to do non-IP networks, then all of a sudden that other mandate that we mentioned on the previous slide will kick in. And I think there might be one more slide on this topic if we advance. Oh yeah, this was this was interesting. There's 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 a thing in the trace back in the traced act that says that providers cannot charge consumers or small businesses for shaking with a line item charge. In the set of rules, the FCC said yes, that's true because the law requires it. We're going to establish our rules that says you can't do that, but we're not going to prohibit cost recovery by alternate means. So if a provider says, well, I I can't afford it. I, I don't know how I'm going to find the money to implement uh, stir shaken. If, if, if they wanted to raise their rates or do something that does not represent it by a line item charge, the FCC is not going to prohibit that. They just can't have a line item charge that says stir shaken. Uh, but cost recovery by alternate means is allowed. So that was an interesting term. If you want to read more about this, we've got a blog post on our website that goes over more detail and other highlights. And it also has a link to the document itself, uh, which is loaded with, with all sorts of interesting rules and explanation. Okay, and the next item that we have is uh, the block, we mentioned this, I think last month, safe harbor rules. There's two types of safe harbor for blocking of robocalls. Uh, if a provider uh, was attempting to block illegal or unwanted robocalls using reasonable analytics, including shaken, did they get safe harbor? And if they block calls from an upstream provider who's known to pass bad calls and has been told about it and they're, they're not doing anything to stop it, then you can block them too. Those are the two scenarios where, you, where providers will be given safe harbor for uh, blocking calls. That takes effect October 14th. And every provider that does such blocking has to provide a single point of contact. If somebody gets blocked and they want to complain or get it unblocked, you have to tell them how to do that. 
Okay, so it's quite a lot, um, uh, quite a lot of activity going on. With that, I'll now turn it over to Alec to uh, take us through stir shaken and call authentication. Thank you, Donald. Um, so, stir shaken and call analytics. So, call analytics is um, is an important part of stir shaken, and I, I want to kind of start by looking at the stir shaken architecture and in where call analytics fits into that. So uh, the originating service provider, when they create originate a call, send that call to the authentication service that they use to create the, the passport, the identity header. And that passport goes through the SIP signaling or out of band and reaches the, ter the call reaches the terminating service provider and the terminating service provider verifies that call uh, you know, using stir shaken to verify that call was signed. And the CVT is a component that's actually in the stir shaken at a standards. Um, and it, it comprises of a couple different things. What do you do when the call is unsigned? What do you do when the call is signed, uh, but the calling and call number mis are mismatched uh, from what's in the passport and the SIP signaling? And then what do you do from a call analytics standpoint. All of that logic is in this module or component called CVT. And that's really where this call analytics sits. Uh, so Stir Shaken was really built to be combined with call analytics and not, um, they're not separate. I think sometimes that can be a point of confusion. Uh, they, they really work well together. Specifically, Stir Shaken provides a couple different pieces of information. It tells you, has the calling number been spoofed? And, and it's, it, I guess it, maybe that's not the best way to phrase it. It tells you the calling number has not been spoofed or that you don't know if it's been spoofed or not. Um, with that positive indication, you know, that at the station level A, the originating party, the originating carrier can confirm that this is a, a, someone using a number that they're supposed to be using. It also tells you the carrier that originated the call. And then finally, it tells you the end entity that originated the call. And when I say end entity, it doesn't tell you, you know, this call was originated by this enterprise and give you their name and address. It gives you this opaque origination ID. It doesn't have a way that you can link it to an individual entity, but it can allow you to link calls together and say all of these calls were originated by the same enterprise or the same call center or the same small business or the same residential line, which can be useful when you're trying to build analytics on top of that. But what it doesn't tell you is if that is an unwanted robocall. For example, a debt collector or a telemarketer. If somebody purchases a DID and makes a phone call using that DID, that, that's not going to fail any of the shaken um, authentication and verification processes. They're using a number they're supposed to be using. It's likely going to be signed at a station level A. Uh, that stir shaking is not going to prevent that. But consumers don't want those calls in many cases. And this is where call analytics comes in. So call analytics tells you, is this call coming from a known robocaller identified by the calling number? This, this calling number keeps getting reported as making a lot of robocalls that people don't want to receive. And it also can, and it, we're starting to see this happen as call analytics engines, you know, integrate more tightly with Stir Shaken. Is it coming from an origination ID that's known to make a lot of robocalls that people don't want? And where call analytics struggles today, because call analytics are, are widely deployed throughout um, the U.S. networks, is with spoof numbers. When, when someone makes a bunch of robocalls and they're spoofing different numbers every time, frequently neighbor spoofing is involved where they're spoofing a number close to the number that they're dialing, call analytics has a very hard time because it's trying to get a reputation, get a sense of how uh, the, the traffic from a given calling number is. But if that calling number is random, it's hard to build AI models that can track this well. But when you put that together with Stir Shaken, when your call analytics engines know I know for a fact that this call actually did come from this number and it was originated from this identifier of, a, of an enterprise. Well, now they can start to build those analytics. Now, how they build those analytics 
it, it's a fairly involved process. It's not there's not just one method that's used to build these uh, these analytics algorithms. It's it's really a, a wide variety of different tactics, from IVRs that are doing uh, voice captcha when someone places a call, they'll get screened and just try and see if there's actually a human on the other end. Honeypots are are an extremely popular method um, for building you know reputation data on calling numbers where you have a bunch of DIDs. And if anybody calls one of those DIDs, which has never been registered by anybody, there's, there shouldn't be anybody's database, you have a very good indication that they are just, you know, war dialing. They're dialing every number increment, you know, going through the next numbers. Uh, that's a, a very important one. Just historical data uh, of the call analytics engines, there's not that many underlying data sources. There's a lot of front-end applications to um, consumers, you know, Nomo Robo and all these different apps that you can get on your phone, but under the hood, the actual data providers, there's actually not nearly as many. And so they have a good sense of the total volume of traffic within all of the networks because they're plugged into so many networks. And so you can, they can build, you know, patterns and, and identify this is a weird pattern that's coming from, you know, these sets of numbers. I haven't seen this before. These are typically, you know, mobile numbers. I see small volumes and now I'm seeing them coming from weird places that they don't typically come from as well as user blacklists, um, when you can you know, go into these apps that you can install on your phone, or like we have apps in our application where you can block individual numbers, those lists of numbers that people manually block feed into these systems where we say, okay, all these people are blocking, we're seeing a large number of people blocking this, uh, that's a good indication that this is uh, probably a bad call. And then dynamic traffic analysis. When I say dynamic traffic analysis, I'm a little bit more mentioning on a, on a per network basis, not uh, the kind of the more historical global uh, US networks combined, but the actual per network basis can be a, another big ingestion point for data. And then probably one of the biggest one is end user feedback. You know, you install that application on your, on your smartphone and, and you get a robocall and you say, this is a robocall um, to, you know, I want to block this call. That you know, it's part of the feedback loop where the, the analytic systems, okay, this, this number is getting reported and it's a little different than, we, you know, user blacklists where people are coming in and preemptively blacking numbers, uh, not kind of tied to a specific call, but actually saying this particular call was bad. Uh, do not originate lists are a big one. Um, you know, the, the list of kind of numbers that people use only to receive calls and will never make outbound calls with that as the calling number. A, a great example of this is the IRS. They have a bunch of 8YY numbers that you can call to talk to somebody. And those are very commonly, or were actually, they really aren't commonly spoofed anymore because almost every carrier blocks them now. But uh, th that's a good example. And there are many other uh, numbers and do not originate lists. And then government data, again, you know, the the FCC and NAMPA, as well as ITU for international numbers, has a lot of information about what numbers are allocated, uh, what numbers are not allocated, and that can be an input into kind of these systems to say, okay, these are using numbers that aren't allocated, that this is a good indication that this is someone spoofing a number. So when you put all of these different mechanisms together, uh, call analytics can be very effective. Uh, the, the only Achilles heel of it is really just when you have good spoofing uh, of numbers, which is hard to do, but we do definitely see that. Uh, when people do a good job of spoofing calling numbers, it is very difficult for an analytics engine to determine that. Um, and this is where stir shaken is really gonna help. Now I wanna get a little bit more specific, just um, you know, in case it's interesting to anybody. You know, we've been talking a lot about stir shaken and call analytics, kind of more looking at the standards uh, but Transnexus is a, a vendor of, of all of these kind of solutions for search shaking and call analytics. And specifically, here are some of the techniques that we use and, and that we help our customers utilize to stop robocalls and unwanted spam calls, this is fraudulent calls that are hitting their network. Manually blacklisting numbers is, is definitely a, a popular technique. Um, there are many situations where people want to block numbers because they are, you know, like that debt collector or telemarketer example, and they aren't doing, um, you know, illegal robocalling. They're using a number consistently, and so you can block those uh, manually effectively. It doesn't work for spoofing, but it, it does work well for, for people who are doing legal robocalling. Um, another very effective technique that we use is blocking on net calls that are calls that are coming from numbers that should be originating on net when they're originating off net. 
So for, you know, for an example, if a call comes in to a carrier's network and that person is doing neighbor spoofing, it's going to look like, you know, it's coming from a number with maybe the last three digits or even four digits changed, but the NPA and XX are going to be the same. There's a high probability that that number is also owned by the carrier that is terminating the call. Uh, unless one of the numbers has been ported out, uh, when you do neighbor spoofing, which is the most common form of spoofing, you're likely going to be spoofing a number um, that belongs to the carrier you're actually sending it to. And carriers can fairly easily identify that that call is coming from one of their own numbers, but it's coming in off net, and they've got a phone registered actively with that number on their network that that's clearly being spoofed. And so by doing that, um, you can you can actually very very effectively block a very large percentage of robocalls. Uh, the only caveat with this is identifying the owner of the number is a little bit more complicated than you might think because of porting. Uh, you do have to have porting aware correction to these systems to be able to, uh, to do that because of course numbers get ported out and then they do originate from an external network if you're not porting aware and, and that can throw off systems that are not porting aware. Invalid numbers, um, you know, that is definitely not as common as neighbor spoofing, but it is actually a, a fairly common technique. A lot of a lot of the robocallers are not as technical as you might think, and they will just spoof uh, random ten digits, uh, one you know followed by ten random digits, and that results in you know a roughly fifty percent of the time it'll be actually an invalid number uh, because only about fifty percent of the NPA and XXs are actually valid in use uh, blocks. Actually, it's even less than that. High risk numbers, we, we kind of use the terms high risk, but it's, it's really uh, numbers that are on do not originate list, numbers that are, uh, are very commonly known to only be termination uh, numbers are, are, are a very, very effective tool. Uh, again, the IRS was just used for such a long time as a, uh, a scam that people have, have recognized the importance of that. And then poor reputation. Reputation, this really is what we, you know, when we talk about analytics, this is where you kind of get a reputation score. So we take all those inputs that I mentioned on the last slide and we build a score for every calling number. Um, and, and just so people are aware, uh, it, what, we, what we end up doing with that is we present that score and uh, not always present the score to the subscriber directly. Typically, the, you know, those scores are zero to 100, and that's typically a little too much information for, for a subscriber. So turn those zero to 100 scores into, typically it's three, low, medium, and high risk, uh, and then provide tools to allow those subscribers to choose. I wanna block calls that are high risk or send calls to voicemail that are high risk. Um, that can be a, a great user experience for, for your subscribers uh, and mitigate you know, the allow you to minimize false positives for the enterprises or the consumers that false positives are a large concern. You know, an example being hospitals. Hospitals tend to be very risk averse when it comes to blocking calls, uh, but on the flip side, they are very worried about denial of service attacks because, um, well, that, I mean, it's just been very popular with people to do denial of service attacks. Same goes for 911, you know, peace apps, emergency call centers, um, sheriff's office. We've seen a lot of, of kind of critical infrastructure and they're very worried about denial of service, but they're also very worried about blocking calls. And when I say denial of service, a lot of times you know, people think that that means an intentional denial of service attack, and that very well could be, uh, but we actually see the most common form of, of denial of service is actually an unintentional robocalling campaign where somebody makes a bunch of robocalls and they're just war dialing, incrementing numbers sequentially. So when they hit that block of numbers that you own, um, you know, you can get a thousand calls in a second with your thousand block because that's the kind of rate that these robocallers are going through their calls. And that is, you know, easily overwhelms most PBXs, uh, you know, PRIs, 23 channels uh, are consumed in fractions of a second. So, you know, that, that can be a, a critical aspect of this where you're, you know, kind of making sure you have subscriber specific um, tooling and not global tooling. Uh, and real-time traffic analysis is a is a key aspect of this. You know, looking at call patterns, I kind of mentioned that a little bit. And then all of this ties in with stir shaken and the verification result. When a call comes in and that call is signed at the station level A, and a consumer clicks, "This is a robocall," uh, we have high confidence that it was not a spoofed call because it was signed at the station level A. So we can quickly 
with only a few people saying this is a robocall, know that that, that number really is doing robocalling. Versus if it doesn't come in with that attestation A, it's not signed or it's attestation C, uh, we want to be a little bit more cautious about marking that call as a robocall because it very well could have just been a spoofed call. So when you put all of these tools together, uh, you, you really can dramatically cut back the number of, of robocalls that subscribers are receiving, uh, both in the you know, scam, illegal robocalling sense, as well as just the unwanted you know, debt collectors and telemarketers that most consumers just are annoyed with and are sick of and are the reason they're canceling all their, their landlines at their homes. And I think we've, we've showed this before, uh, but I do just want to kind of end on, the, on this uh, note. One of the ex important aspects of Stir Shaken and all this call analytics is, is how you present this information uh, to the subscriber, to the consumer or the business, that whoever's receiving that phone call. And this was originally proposed by Comcast, and we adopted this uh, a few years ago, and, and we've seen great success uh, with this in, in subscriber understanding of what's going on. Um, it's really pretty simple. When a call comes in and that call has a, a shaken passport and it's attestation A um, and, and doesn't have a bad history, you know, that analytics look, all the analytics algorithms result that this, this seems like it's a good call. Then what the subscriber sees is a V prefix and then the, the caller display name. Um, we're hoping that the Polycom and, and the other kind of handset manufacturers as well as, you know, of course, Android and iOS will soon uh, add support for the Verstat parameter. I know like iOS does this just on the call log. They don't yet do it on the calling screen, um, but this will hopefully be, be rolled out soon. Uh, and so instead of doing a V with a prefix, you can do this green check. It's a little bit more modern of a way of displaying this, uh, but this does work on, on older displays, which is nice. And when the call comes in, you know, that's an anonymous call. That's a big concern. How do you, you know, do shaking for anonymous calls? Uh, it's actually not, not a, a significant challenge because the originating service provider, when they are in creating a call and, and the person wants to set that caller ID as, as hidden, uh, they do still send the call information to the other service providers in the network. Uh, and so you can actually have a, a verified or a green check next to anonymous where, where you're not allowed to see that. And then if the call is, is just a robocall, then we, we want to indicate to the subscriber that that is spam. Uh, and so we do that using, the again, the Comcast design of, of putting that in less than or greater than symbols. And a key aspect that I will mention about this, uh, the reason for these kind of symbols in here is to make sure that we can prevent somebody from going into their CNAM database and setting their caller display name to start with a V. So every call always looks like it has a V, even, even if it wasn't signed. Um, so part of you know the reason that with this these symbols are used is to then block these symbols from ever being included in a normal scene and dips returned result uh, and then you, you, know, you can have that here so that's really how these call analytics and stir shaking systems work um, and I, I hope that provided a good amount of information I want to open it up to any questions and, and opportunity to discuss in any more detail